In 2007, he told Cinema Blend, I got a call from the creator-producer of CSI, and he asked me if I was interested in participating. I said, yeah, provided I'm the killer. On January 19th, 2019, Chris opened a new show called Chris Angel Mind Freak in the newly renamed Chris Angel Theater at Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. Here, Chris tells people to rip off their clothes if they want to. This is how it works. Now, I want you to remember this throughout the entire show. You give me lots of energy. Stand up, applaud, scream. That's amazing. Rip your damn clothes off. <laughs> In Luke 8:27, Jesus encounters a possessed man who was naked. Mark 5:15 indicates that another man, when he was possessed, went around unclothed. The reason that so many people today post pictures of themselves not properly clothed or naked is demonic possession or influence. And uh, I could just say, in this show, people freak out when I levitate. I mean, you see the audience's responses, you know, for yourself. But in the new show, when I levitate, random people in the audience will levitate. No BS. Wow. So you're saying that I could be sat next to somebody who could just suddenly take off. This is something that I've wanted to do 20 years ago. As you enter Chris's new Planet Hollywood Theater, there's a quote from Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, the most famous rock song of all time. As some may know, the quote Chris has featured from Stairway to Heaven contains a satanic message when played backwards. Led Zeppelin is the biggest selling hard rock band of all time. The founder of the band was Jimmy Page. Page was extremely interested in the occult and magic. Quote, encountering his writings for the first time at age 11, Page immersed himself in Aleister Crowley's writings as a teen and young man. He began collecting rare magic books. He opened an occult bookstore in London called Equinox. Led Zeppelin's 1976 album called Presence features a family sitting around a table staring at a black obelisk. The obelisk is an occult symbol. However, I've, I've, I've read books and spent a lot of time reading books on uh, mysticism of uh, Eastern and Western traditions and, and, um, and uh, comparative religions. And, uh, and then astrology, etc. Page's fascination with Crowley led many to believe he was into black magic himself. I think he was absolutely fascinated with the man and the knowledge of the will. I don't think, I mean, you know, he owned a lot of manuscripts and he, he bought the Inverness Castle. That was also Crowley's. And I think with it, he had purchased a lot of manuscripts. And at one point he had a bookstore in England, an occult bookstore. And he was really more fascinated by the knowledge of it. It was a sincere fascination, and I think he took a lot out of it. He was very interested in those types of things, otherworldly things. By age 15, Jimmy Page had become a devout follower of occultist magician Aleister Crowley, who was dubbed the wickedest man in the world. But it wasn't until the release of Zeppelin III that Page revealed his interest in the dark side. In 1971, Page attended a Sotheby's auction by Crowley's estate, where he met filmmaker Kenneth Anger. The two become friendly. Page purchases Crowley's Bullockskeen house located on the shores of Loch Ness next to a graveyard. 
a house which was once a church that burned to the ground while the congregation was inside. I struggle with some of the, the lyrics from particular periods of time and I don't know, you know, uh, the musicality and the, and the construction of it is, is you know, it's peerless. But um, maybe I didn't quite feel the same about the lyrics a little bit later on in life as I got a bit further down the road. Um, so maybe I'm still trying to work out what I was talking about. <laughs> maybe you were channeling, Robert. Channeling is a good so one, yeah. <laughs> Owen Glyndur is, you know, <laughs> that's where it came from, yeah. We've already seen that Paige admitted I've employed Crowley's system into my own day-to-day -day life, and that is the way big names are made these days. Crowley's system was to establish contact with demons, spirits. The biography Hammer of the Gods states that Jimmy spent his days in his suite with his shades drawn and candles lit. He spent his days and nights wide awake, holding his guitar, waiting for something to come through. Robert Plant admitted that his reception of the song was automatic. In the occult, automatic writing takes place as a demon channels a message through the human medium. He must have written three quarters of the lyrics on the spot, said Page. He didn't have to go away and think about them. Robert Plant admitted, Page had written the chords and played them for me. I was holding the paper and pencil, and for some reason I was in a very bad mood. Then all of a sudden, I was writing out words. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's buying a stairway to heaven. I just sat there and looked at the words, and then I almost leapt out of my seat. Stairway to Heaven is actually laced with backward satanic messages. We are talking about words that say one thing forward, and then when those same words are played backwards, there is yet another intelligible message. But this satanic phenomenon goes far beyond the scope of human ingenuity and is demonically inspired. Bob Garcia of AM Records stated, quote, It must be the devil, because nobody here knows how to do it. Here we see Robert Plant, while singing Stairway to Heaven, telling his fans that sometimes words have two meanings as he signs with his hands that they are both forward and backwards. There's a sign on the wall But she wants to be sure Cause you know sometimes words have to mean me To get critics even, you know, or the skeptics to show them what I'm going to do, I've actually taken the exact piece of tape that you just heard it off of and I've reverse thread the machine and I'm going to play that exact piece of tape backwards now. Okay, okay just to... That you've not doctored it I have it not in any doctored way. it in any way. All right, let's, let's go ahead and start. Okay. Mm -hmm. I heard something there. All right, listen for I Live With Satan, exactly. You might want to turn it up just a little out here on the floor. I live with Satan. Listen again. Okay. I live with Satan. How many in the audience heard that? All right. <laughs> now, now let's let's get that vote on videotape here. How many actually heard that? All right. All right. Let's go on. All right, try, try another piece. This is something I found the other day. See if you hear the Lord turn me off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, Lord. <laughs> the audience is voting here. They, they're hearing it. Let's go on. Try that for you. Slow it down. See if you hear there's no escaping it. There's no okay. escaping it. Yeah. That is actually, and it makes me wonder. When he says, and it makes me wonder, backwards is translated into there's no escaping it. Try it one more time.
all hear that? All right, we'll go on. You, you'll hear, here's to my sweet Satan. You'll hear some words, which I could take time to tell you what they are, but I won't. And it, then you'll hear there's power in Satan. And I'll, well, let's just, let's just go on. There's power in Satan. One more time. Six. Yeah. And, you know, again, I can't explain this. I don't know why it's saying that. Uh, let's go on. All right. I'll end it there. I think that gives you an idea. Crowley's motto of do what thou wilt was inscribed on the vinyl of Led Zeppelin's album, Led Zeppelin Three. Jimmy Page was a collector of Aleister Crowley's memorabilia who, quote, had read a lot of Crowley and was fascinated by his ideas. Page encountered Crowley's writings at age 11 and later bought Crowley's home. Page said he believed Crowley's home would be a good atmosphere in which to write songs. Page did everything he could to return the house to how it would have looked during Crowley's ownership. Page commissioned an artist to paint some Crowley-esque murals on the walls. For a certain period of time, Page left the home in the care of his friend Malcolm Dent. Although Dent was a skeptic of the, quote, paranormal, he soon started to experience strange occurrences. After a few weeks, he heard strange rumblings from the hallway, which stopped when he investigated, but resumed after he had closed the bedroom door. Den awoke one night to hear what sounded like a wild animal snorting and banging outside his bedroom door. It went on for some time and it was not until morning that Dent dared to open the bedroom door. When he did, there was nothing there. Dent added, quote, whatever was there was pure evil. Another friend who had stayed at the home awoke one night claiming she had been attacked by some kind of devil. There were other occurrences such as chairs switching places, doors slamming open and closed for no reason, and carpets and rugs rolling up inexplicably. Page's childhood friend Malcolm Dent stayed there for 20 years before Page sold the place. As he told the Inverness Courier in a 2006 interview, doors would be slamming all night. You'd go into a room and carpets and rugs would be piled up. Even though he's a self-described skeptic, Dent couldn't explain why any of this was happening. In 1975, he gave an interview to Rolling Stones magazine where he described some of the feelings he got from the haunted monument. When the interviewer went on to clarify that Page himself never had contact with the spirits, Page cut in with, I didn't say that. He went on to tell the interviewer that he preferred not to discuss the issue further. What happened in Crowley's home is similar to what happens in some cases of haunted houses. Some might wonder why a demon would reveal a spiritual world to people by opening and closing doors and making other noises. The demon has a calculated reason for repeatedly making these annoying noises. The demon knows that if these noises happen frequently enough, a person will get extremely frustrated. Then it becomes more likely that a person will call out to the unknown spirit asking the spirit what it wants. The person might interact with the spirit so that it will stop bothering him. Once he willingly interacts with the evil spirit, he becomes open to demonic possession. When I was in a room alone, it felt like I wasn't alone, like there was like a presence there, something I'd not experienced before. And through 1989, this presence got stronger and stronger and stronger until um, I sat on, um, on, on a bed in an empty hotel room in um, early 1990, actually March 1990. And I said out into the room, if there's something there, would you please contact me? Because you're driving me up the bloody wall. Also, you said on a show with Terry Wogan back in April 29, 1991, you said the, the, the challenge started off with you're the son of God. 
This home looks quiet from the outside, but owner Deanna Simpson says several ghosts are haunting it, and she's caught them in photos and recordings, including this one. The majority are bad, dark forces, unhuman. Just a couple minutes into the interview, our photojournalist Nick felt his wrist burning. Are you okay? Did you get scratched? He was behind the camera, but Simpson knew what had happened right away. She took us on a tour of the house. She shot video of this door. If that is you, would you please shut that door? Oh my God. It appears to close on its own, and both Simpson and her cat have been pushed down these stairs before. So far in this house, Nick has been scratched. I've been touched and pinched. We've seen strange lights on the walls and heard noises, and we haven't even gone down to the basement yet. So where is the place where you saw the shadow man picture? This photo was taken with a deer camera in the basement. Uh, this picture right here is the shadow man. Um, he's about seven foot tall. Simpson says she's scared by what's happened, but she and her husband have lived in this home for seven years. Her grown daughters refuse to stay here. We put everything into this house, and we do want his move but we would have to list it at such a price to where we could recoup what we put in. Meanwhile, the family has invited mediums, researchers, and priests to visit the home. Help me. Help me. Some time ago in this Litchfield home, wife and mother Pat Redding felt as if she were possessed by evil spirits. She went through a series of 16 exorcisms, witnessed firsthand by her daughter, Michelle. When you see the person that you love being attacked by something invisible, so heinous and so disgusting, you will look for anything to stop it. The situation started, says Michelle, with strange banging noises in their home. It moved on to a mysterious overturning of all their furniture and eventually to attacks on Pat Redding from an invisible force. It would rip her hair out. There'd be plenty of witnesses and it would rip it right out of her scalp. An invisible force. She'd scream, she'd jerk backward. I'd turn around, she'd be in pain. Of course, she would panic, she'd cry, she was shocked. And did she have actual physical marks on her body? Absolutely. Yes. And they couldn't have been self-inflicted? No. Bite marks on her back. She would end up with black and blue marks in the most bizarre places that she wouldn't have been able to do herself. But how do you know that it's not uh, somebody with psychological problems? I mean, different psychological problems can manifest themselves in very strong Absolutely. ways. She um, uh, was found to have no psychosis. She, there was nothing wrong with her. Medically? Physically, everything had been ruled out. Exhausted. And, yeah. and to that point, that's when a decision had to be made. And that's when, yeah, actually, we had the Roman Catholic Church involved with it. Our Father who art in heaven, have it be thy name. Connecticut Bishop McKenna agreed to perform the exorcism, although it was not officially sanctioned by the Vatican. <laughs> Actresses say it's the demons inside that give the possessed strange voices and unusual strength. They say that necessitated restraining Pat during her exorcism. Before this happened, did you believe in possession? Did you believe? No. Before this happened, we weren't your average middle class family. Then what do the two of you say to people out there watching this who I'm sure are thinking, these look like perfectly nice people, but you cannot convince me your mom was possessed by demons there's really no way to convince them unless they want to believe but i knew my mother and she didn't believe at all in that and it existed on march 20th 2012 jimmy page released an album called lucifer rising and other soundtracks it contained music that Page produced but never used for Kenneth Anger's film Lucifer Rising. Page subsequently committed to performing the musical score of Anger's film Lucifer Rising. Lucifer Rising began production in 1967 but was plagued by tragedy. A five-year-old boy named Goddard, cast to play the Lucifer child, leapt from his apartment window to his death. 
Bobby Boussolet, cast to play the Lucifer team, joined the Manson family and murdered school teacher Gary Hinman. On Jimmy Page's website, he says these music tracks, which were originally produced in the early 1970s, quote, have been revisited, remixed, and released for the first time. Page lists some of the tracks on the album titles like Lucifer Rising and Incubus. Incubus is considered to be the name of a demon. Many of the most well-known rock musicians in history were fans or had a devotion to the Satanist Crowley. According to Beatles drummer Ringo Starr, the cover of their Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album showed people the Beatles liked and admired. This included the Satanist Aleister Crowley. The Doors had a picture of Crowley on their album cover. Exposing the forbidden, the occult, witchcraft, spiritism. Part of being self-controlled and alert is to be wise to Satan's schemes, but not to delve into the details of every occult practice and phenomenon. We must understand that the devil's ultimate goal is to destroy our lives, so we must take the offensive by putting on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist on the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance in every request for all the saints. Divination Even though the Bible opens our eyes to the reality of a life that is beyond the natural world, God warns us about the dangers that exist in seeking supernatural manifestations without the Holy Spirit at the center of that search. There is a compelling reason why the Holy Spirit is called holy, which means that He is pure, good, godly, clean, and untainted. This, therefore, implies that in the spiritual realm, there are other spirits apart from God's Holy Spirit. These spirits are evil, dark, unholy, destructive, filthy, demonic, wicked and sinful, even though they may appear harmless on the surface. However, at their root is the spirit of idolatry. These are called familiar spirits, and they must be exposed through our knowledge from God's Word for ignorance in their biggest weapon of destruction. Too many people have gotten into serious troubles that could have been avoided. If only they knew the dangers of seeking directions and validation from vile spirits that are only interested in making our chains stronger, yokes bigger, and burdens heavier. So, what is divination? It is basically the practice of seeking knowledge of the future of the unknown by supernatural means through familiar and demonic spirits. These include palm or card readings, speaking with mediums and psychics, shady seers, spiritualists, and even people that pretend to be prophets of God. Some also claim to speak to the dead on behalf of the living. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 says, Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In fact, some of their words and information may be true, but what we must watch out for is the Spirit driving them from behind the scenes. As believers, we must become aware that it is not just the Holy Spirit of God that reveals deep secrets, but also evil spirits that are aware of such things. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 19 through 14 says, When you enter the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable, repulsive practices of those nations, 
There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire as a sacrifice, one who uses divination and fortune-telling, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a charm or spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or a necromancer who seeks the dead. For everyone who does these things is utterly repulsive to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless, complete, perfect before the Lord your God. For these nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and diviners and fortune tellers. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. Today, a whole lot of divination is packaged as harmless fun for the curious mind in these modern times. But we must be careful not to fall cheap prey to these demons, as divination has always been a practice, even in ancient times. That brings problems and traps for the naive. The Word of God instructs us to discard the works of darkness and anything that doesn't have the Spirit of God as the source. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 10-13 through 13. Trying to learn by experience, what is pleasing to the Lord, and letting your lifestyles be examples of what is most acceptable to Him, your behavior expressing gratitude to God for your salvation. Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things that such people practice in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light of God's precepts. For it is light that makes everything visible. Life in the kingdom of God should be about pleasing our Lord, and divination does not in any way please God. Please note that some prophets can start out as real servants, but end up as false prophets when they are carried away by lust, greed, or carnality. There will always be diviners, witches, mediums, and false prophets that are agents of the devil to lure people into darkness. But the responsibility is ours as mature believers to identify and discern which spirit drives those that we come in contact with. We must then flee from them and tell others how to escape from their bondage before it is too late. The Bible spells out the dangers of divination. Here are some of the consequences for those who consult diviners. First, they will be driven away from the kingdom of light, which is their safe zone, and God will turn his back against them. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Listen carefully. I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders that will occur in Israel from the Lord of hosts, who dwells on Mount Zion. When the people, instead of trusting God, say to you, consult the mediums who try to talk to the dead, and the soothsayers who chirp and whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Direct those people to the law and to the testimony. If their teachings are not in accord with this word, it is because they have no dawn. They who consult mediums and soothsayers will pass through the land deeply distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will become enraged and will curse their king and their God as they look upward. Then they will look to the earth. They will see only distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness and overwhelming night. Second, God will judge and bear witness against them swiftly. Malachi chapter 3 verses 5 through 7 says, Then I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, and against those who oppress the laborer in his wages and widows and the fatherless, and against those who turn away the alien from his right, and those who do not fear me with awe-filled reverence, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change, but remain faithful to my covenant with you. That is why you, O sons of Jacob, have not come to an end. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have turned away from my statutes and ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Number three, it blocks our access to God's mercy when we put these evil spirits before him. Micah chapter three, verses one through eight says, And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know and administer justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin off my people and their flesh from their bones, you who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them. 
break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot, like meat in a kettle. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will even hide his face from them at that time, withholding his mercy, because they have practiced and tolerated and ignored evil acts. Thus says the Lord concerning the false prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something good to bite with their teeth, they call out peace. But against the one who gives them nothing to eat, they declare a holy war. Therefore, it will be night, tragedy for you, without vision, and darkness, cataclysm for you, without foresight. The sun shall go down on the false prophets, and the day shall become dark and black over them. The seer shall be ashamed, and the diviners discredited and embarrassed. Indeed, they shall all cover their mouths in shame, because there is no answer from God. But in fact, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Number 4. Divination stirs up God's anger, for he is a jealous God that cannot stand the sin of seeking other gods. Zechariah chapter 10 verses 2 through 3 says, For the teraphim, household idols, speak wickedness, emptiness, worthlessness, and the diviners see lying visions and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted and suffer because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, who are not true shepherds, and I shall punish the male goats, leaders. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Witchcraft in the Bible The Bible condemns all forms of witchcraft, including fortune-telling, necromancy, and other related practices as satanic counterfeits to holy spirituality. This is why King Saul died. 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 tells us that Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance. Saul was in a bad situation as the Philistines prepared to go to war against Israel. He was terrified, but he didn't just have a military problem. He also had a spiritual one. The Lord's prophet Samuel had died. Samuel was a key figure in his life. Samuel anointed him as king. Samuel also let him know what the God of Israel wanted. Now that Samuel was gone, the Lord had refused to respond to Saul's advice requests. Previously, in accordance with Moses' law, Saul had expelled mediums and spiritists from the land. Now, desperate from supernatural guidance, Saul resorted to that which God had clearly prohibited. As king over God's people, he was a complete failure. A medium was someone who communicated with the dead in order to predict the future. Saul was unconcerned about God's law. He was desperate for answers, so he disguised himself and went to a medium to have her consult the spirit for him. The woman was concerned that this was a sting operation because such people had been eradicated in Israel by the king. But Saul assured her that she would be safe. So as requested, she summoned Samuel from the dead and was astounded as anyone else when the prophet appeared. She immediately recognized her client as King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 14 through 19. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up wrapped in a robe. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid respect to him. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am greatly distressed, for the Philistines are making war against me, and God has left me and no longer answers me, either through prophets or by dreams. Therefore I have called you to make known to me what I should do, Samuel said. Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has left you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done to you just as he said through me when I was with you, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. 
Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not execute his fierce wrath of Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also put Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me among the dead. Indeed, the Lord will put the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Rivers of ink have been spilled by commentators arguing whether or not this account was a genuine return of Samuel's spirit from the dead. The text presents it as such, rather than as a demon impersonating Samuel or implying that the medium merely used her wits to deceive Saul. It's unlikely that an impersonator could have fooled Saul, and Samuel's message of judgment on Saul, including his loss of the kingdom to David, his impending death, and Israel's defeat, was exactly what happened. As a result, it appears that God used an otherwise forbidden method to deliver his verdict on a rebellious Saul. When Saul asked Samuel for assistance, claiming that God had abandoned him, Samuel responded, Of course he has. Saul had disobeyed the Lord's clear instructions, and the Lord had wrenched the throne from Saul's grasp. Then Samuel announced God's final judgment on the house of Saul. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. That is, dead. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 20 through 25. Then Saul immediately fell full length on the earth, floor of the medium's house, and was very afraid because of Samuel's words. And he was thoroughly exhausted because he had not eaten all day and all night. A woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly troubled, and she said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you, and I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to everything you said to me. So now, please listen to the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat, so that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman urged him, and he finally listened to them. So he got up from the ground and sat on the bed. The woman had a fattened calf in the house. She quickly killed it and took flour, kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread. She brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they got up and went away that night. Samuel's words knocked the doomed king to the ground. He was terrified and weak due to a lack of nutrition. Even the medium felt sorry for what had to be a pitiful sight of Israel's king, practically fainting in terror. She tried to persuade Saul to eat and eventually persuaded him to do so. Finally, the entourage disbanded and returned to the Israelite camp. It was Saul's final night on earth. The tragic battle prophesied by Samuel in chapter 28 of Samuel between Israel and the Philistines took place on Mount Gilbo. The Philistines targeted Israel's leaders, Saul and his sons, following a common strategy in ancient warfare. Jonathan and two of his brothers were killed, and Saul received serious injuries. Saul was well aware that if the Philistines discovered him alive, he would be subjected to a slow, torturous death. To avoid torture, Saul ordered his armor-bearer to run him through with his sword. However, the armor-bearer was too afraid and unwilling to oppose the king, so he refused Saul's command. As a result, Saul was killed by his own sword. When the men of Israel on both sides of the Jordan River saw that Saul was dead, they fled in panic and abandoned some cities completely, allowing the Philistines to settle in them. Saul's disobedience to God and complete spiritual collapse ended tragically not only for him and his family, but also for the people of Israel who insisted on having him as their king despite God's warnings. Their king had died, his family had been decimated, Israel's army had been shattered, and the nation had lost some of its territory. Worst of all, the Lord's name had been desecrated. Importantly, Saul could still have received God's blessing if he had chosen to obey the Lord wholeheartedly. However, Saul's half-hearted attitude toward God's commands, as well as his proclivity to excuse himself and blame others, revealed character flaws that God knew would disqualify him as king. The author of 1 Chronicles clearly summarized the reason for Saul's death. Evil Forces at Work This truth is reinforced when we look at other sections of the New Testament. Jesus provides a prophetic description of the spiritual and political patterns that will manifest themselves when thinking of the end times. He tells us two things about false prophets and false Christs in this sermon. He begins by saying, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. Then he restates it, 
false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. There will be false prophets and false Christs with supernatural power at the end of the century. Those that are not rooted in Christ and do not understand God's power and the truth of God's word would be deceived. Some people are misguided enough to believe that God is the source of all supernatural power. This isn't correct. God on the one hand and Satan on the other are both sources of supernatural power. There is no third source. Jesus cautioned us that at the end of this century, divine satanic power would be released with only one goal in mind, to deceive. Paul says, Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, the close of the age, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The faith mentioned in this passage is Christianity. It is not just any faith, it is the faith. The people Paul is writing about have been Christians for a long time. He does warn, however, that they will be led away from the faith by seducing satanic spirits who will trick them with false teaching. We see another illustration of the same powers at work in Paul's letter to Timothy. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Where the Bible says impostors, the standard Greek word is for a magician or an enchanter. This is not merely any type of deceiver. It is a person who cultivates satanic supernatural power on purpose. A magician is anyone who resembles a witch, a sorcerer, a fortune teller, or a clairvoyant. Such people function by spiritual force and revelation that has a satanic purpose, rather than their own natural capacity and understanding. These satanically motivated servants of Satan, who are evil people of corrupted human nature, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. No one is more deceptive than the one who is deceived. We sometimes wonder at how anyone can tell us huge lies and expect us to believe them. That individual is deceived is the answer. He or she really believes what they are doing. The most deceptive of all people are those who have been deceived. In the New Testament, sorcery is translated from the Greek word pharmakia. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. There are only two sources of spiritual power, God and Satan. Satan is only the power that God allows him to have, but it is considerable. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. To speak spirituality, knowledge, or power apart from God is idolatry, closely related to witchcraft. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23 says, For rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as reprehensible as false religion and idolatry. Since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The practice of witchcraft is associated with Satan, and it involves initiating what God does. Its core desire is to gain knowledge of the future and manipulate events that are beyond our control. However, these abilities belong solely to the Lord. This desire has its roots in Satan's initial temptation to Eve. When he tempted her with the idea that she could become like God, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Since the Garden of Eden, Satan has been focused on diverting human hearts away from worshiping the true God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God really said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. He entices humans with the suggestions of power, self-realization, and spiritual enlightenment apart from submission to the Lord God. Witchcraft is merely another branch of that enticement. To become involved in witchcraft in any way is to enter Satan's realm, seemingly harmless modern entanglements. Any practice which draws power from sources other than Jesus Christ is considered as witchcraft. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, witches are mentioned along with those who will not be able to inherit eternal life. While we don't need to be afraid of Satan's power, it is important that we stay away from it and show respect towards it. As stated in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, 
greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Being aware of Satan's potential to create chaos, harm, and destruction, we must be cautious and avoid any involvement with his power, even as believers. Let us pray. Dear God, I am grateful for everything you have given me, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Whenever I find myself in tough situations, I seek your guiding light, and it pulls me away from wrongdoing and leads me towards the path of righteousness. I am grateful for the gift of your wisdom, which has helped me make sense of the world and navigate life's challenges with grace. Your guidance has shaped my path in ways I could never have imagined, and your love has given me the strength to live your truth and follow your commandments. Thank you for your unwavering support, your boundless compassion, and your infinite grace. I pray that you continue to bless me with your love and guidance, and that you help me to be a light in the darkness for those who need it most. Amen. We've covered demons, all demons, every demon, but today we're venturing into new territory. This time, demons who have aided magicians during magic tricks. Throughout history, many people have questioned whether magicians had deep-rooted ties to demons, that there was no logical way that the tricks they present to us could ever be real. Some dark force or entity has to have their hand in there, pulling the strings somehow. Well, today in Top 5 Scary Videos, we're going to be examining some specific times a greater force was at play with our list of the top five magicians who used demons. Let's jump in. In at 5, Christian Yoti. According to many theorists, the visible universe has an invisible counterpart, giving us the ability to draw on good and evil spirits, lying dormant in our realm and the next. Using black magic, it is possible to contact these entities in order to aid magicians in a particular act. Christian did just that. In one act, it is clearly visible that something greater was at play than just himself. In the act, he can be seen levitating a small ball, while holding three others in each hand that are constantly in motion. However, don't look at his hands, but instead his eyes. His eyes are dark, almost black, but during one moment he blinks, revealing clear eyes. Eyes that are perhaps no longer his own, but someone else's that could be residing inside himself. Perhaps confirming that his physical body is out of control and that the power inside is using an invisible power to levitate the balls. In at 4, Yif. Yif is a magician who specifically relies on elements from religion to aid in his tricks, and in the process pushing the message of Jesus and steering towards the dark. One trick in particular begins with him showing his friends a picture of Moses, stating, Who is he? Who on earth is he? Moses, the greatest myth in history. People tell their children that there was a man who parted the sea. It became a legend. We magicians should be challenging legends. And Yif did just that. The very next day he took a cup of coffee, parting it completely down the middle using what? Well, seemingly nothing other than the power from his hands and a little bit of breath. What magic was at play? Well, with the religious ties to the trick, many believed that he conjured a demonic entity to assist him. Or perhaps the legend of Moses himself took part in the act. What do you guys think though? In at 3, Mirandejo. Arnold Kentskis, known more famously by the pseudonym Mirandejo, was a Dutch magician in the 20s and 30s who was commonly known for radically piercing his body with various objects, resulting in seemingly no injury. Astounding medical professionals in the process. Now many are unsure whether he had psychological health issues, causing his delusions and lack of fear. But many think he had ties to a demon, a demon that spoke to him, telling him to pierce his body with needles. In the end, this was his ultimate demise. It was reported that Mirren was instructed by voices to eat a steel needle, which he did. It was surgically removed two days later. That same day, he walked out of the hospital, appearing completely fine. However, not long after, he entered a trance-like state, laying down on his bed, never waking up. Were the voices the result of underlying health issues or was it something more? Coming in at 2, Dynamo. It's always come into question whether Dynamo was a member of a secret society, seeking to break the laws of the universe by calling upon a higher power or dark magic to aid him in his trick. Dynamo has become one of the world's most recognized and renowned magicians, whose tricks are unfathomable and can only be 
explained by something grander than the universe. I'm going to be discussing two occasions, the first being the necklace. During one trick Dynamo asks a guy to pull his necklace through his neck, which he does. He examines the necklace, there is nothing unusual, no weak element, no missing link. Yet he was able to pull it right through Dynamo's own neck, there was no blood, nothing, not even a scar. So how did he do it? Well to many a great power was at play, aiding the magician in his trick. Not only that, but on another occasion Dynamo walked across the Thames in London, with seemingly no wires or strings to keep him afloat. The symbolism of Jesus walking on water was not lost on viewers, and again many were quick to name the devil as his aid during the trick. And lastly under number 1, David Blaine. Seems David Blaine takes a lot of cues from another number on our list, Mirandejo. Blaine has mastered the ability to pierce his own body with needles and objects, remaining unharmed in the process and leaving no marks or scars following it. On one occasion he sat down with Ricky Gervais, forcing him to watch on as he pierced his bicep with a long needle, and then made Gervais remove it. He does just that, in horror of course, stating that this is not a trick, this is real what have you done, exactly what we all thought, until the needle was removed and there was no blood, or seemingly any marks, and to quote Blaine, that's the one thing that doesn't make any sense. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Freemason, confessed that all magicians were aided by demonic entities. Is Blaine one of those magicians? Give me your both fingers. Perfect. Can you see the shadow? Mm -hmm. The shadow of your hands, of my hands? Can you see the shadow? Okay, when I say one, two, three, take your hands away. One, two, three. <laughs> next to me, next to me. Yeah. Look at my eyes, look at my eyes. Yeah. Hey! Oh, <laughs> man! Hey! <laughs> look. Whoa! Where's my money? Where's my money? You want to get your money back? Yeah, of course. Look, 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 look. What? Sorry, it doesn't work. <laughs> Watch the car. What? Check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out. I'm gonna use the four eagles. Watch. Fire. No, 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 no. Earth. Water. Come on, come on, come on. And wait. You have the spirits, it's not magic, it's the spirits. You have the devil, I swear. Look at this. Right? Yes. Look. What? Whoa. Check it out. <laughs> Crazy. Like this. And like this. Of the car? Yes. Okay. If I just do like this. I 
are ready? Yes. One, two. No. Hi. <laughs> Whoa! 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 Oh God! <laughs> and now, open it. There it is. What? Yeah, we can't just hide. Just get out of here. You can touch it. It's your car. Look, 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 No, 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 no. Wenn ich deinen Kopf berühre, du kannst deine Hand wieder wegmachen. Eins, zwei, drei. Und die Hand ist weg. Du kannst die Hand wieder wegmachen. 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 Marie-José Perec! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Jesus Christ, a lot! Can I have your phone? Yeah, sure. Great, great. Look. <laughs> Why you know that? What's your card? Oh! Turn it back up. Oh my god. <laughs>